Okay, I'm Skylar Tibbetts. I'm faculty at MIT in the Department of Architecture. Um, Outside of MIT, I run the 3D Printing Additive Manufacturing Journal, so I thought that might be you know, relevant for this audience. I'm personally interested in that because the journal brings together all different disciplines. Um, we're not only interested in 3D printing, the plus sign, um, I, I added that when I joined, um, because we want to think about what's next. We also want to think about the broadest definition of additive, so we look at you know, everything from growing materials to textiles to you know, all sorts of new frontiers. Um, but it's, you know, anyone in that space from software to hardware to materials to design to art, you know, really brings many different people together. Um, academically, I direct our undergraduate design minor and design major program in the Department of Architecture. Um, and I'm really passionate about that because it really allows students, MIT undergrads across campus, no matter what their major or minor is, to um, create hybrid design disciplines. So we can be mechanical engineering and design, computer science and design, physics and design, biology and design. They can major in design, double major in design, minor in design. We have all sorts of interesting classes, amazing faculty teaching in that. Um, and by design, we don't necessarily mean product design. It could be that, but it also could be fashion design, graphic design, interaction design, you know, all disciplines of design. Um, and then now that is also part of the Academy for Design on campus. But what I'm going to talk about today is the lab. So I co-direct a lab called the Self-Assembly Lab. Um, we're in N52, where the Morningside space is right now. Um, we have lots of amazing researchers. We've had students from all across campus, lots of different disciplines. Many of them came from that um, uh, design minor, design major program, or from course four, but from you know, all different courses across campus. And we look at roughly three scales, materials, fabrication, and construction. So I'll go through those. Um, but how did I get here? So I have a background in architecture, and when I first started studying, you know, we were drafting T-squares, uh, you know, pencil, and then obviously CAD came, and that influenced how we design. That then led to CAM, that led to computational design. And within a few short years, our discipline radically changed because of computing. This is the first CAD tool developed at MIT in 1960s um, by Sutherland. And I was using that at, after graduating from undergrad. I came to MIT as a grad student, and I started doing these exhibitions and installations around the world. And I was using computation as a way to generate geometry, to analyze that geometry, unroll it, design details, material connections. So code became just like the pencil. Code became a tool to creatively imagine, uh, to de literally design and generate new possible ideas. This was built on campus for the 150th anniversary um, but there's a similar parallel here. 1955, the first CNC machine developed here at MIT, the first time they connected a computer to a milling machine. And I was similarly using that to then CNC mill these parts. So code was not only being used to design, but code was now a language to make. And computation was radically changing both how we imagine and how we physically create. But you could replace this with an image of printing, robots, laser cutters, water jets, you know, all the CNC tools. And that radically changed how we make in our discipline and, and many other disciplines. But the thing we don't talk about is construction. There was no code for construction. So I became really interested in that. Like, it's super elegant on the design side when you're generating all these beautiful things. It's fairly elegant when you send the code to the machine and you fabricate all these complex parts. And we drink the Kool-Aid of mass customization. We all talk about like free complexity and we can produce anything we want. But we don't often talk about how difficult that makes on the construction side. You know, look at the Frank Gehry problem of many, many parts, super hard to build. How, to, how do you put these things together? You know, there's really no elegant way. This is blood, sweat, and tears. We're literally brute forcing this stuff together. So I became very interested in that part of the problem. And that's where you know, almost all of our research since then has focused on that. As a grad student, I was in Neil Gershenfeld's lab, the Center for Bits and Atoms, under a DARPA grant, Programmable Matter. Um, and at that time, over a decade ago, programmable matter meant robots. Like, program matter, literally program through robots, small scale, big scale, make everything out of robots. I was in charge of the larger scale, so meter scale robots. And they would squirm around and they would reconfigure. Um, Eric and Marty Domain were on some of this. And we had these strands that would fold and go from one shape to another shape. And at that time, it was super exciting. They had millimeter scale to large scale. But I kept coming up against this question in my head that we really don't want to build buildings out of robots. Because buildings out of robots, you know, if every brick is a robot, it's going to be super expensive, lots of energy, it's going to be hard to assemble, it's going to fail too often. Like, 
the idea of programmability doesn't truly scale up, um, at least in the architecture discipline. So I became interested in that question, and then I started to focus on materials, thinking that if we can program materials, then we can get all the programmability, the sensing, the actuation, the reconfiguration, the assembly, all the stuff we're talking about, but we don't need all the electromechanical parts. And so materials became the key to do that. So one of the main research categories in my lab is called programmable materials, the idea that we program physical materials, change shape, change property, act as sensors or actuators. It's basically customizable smart materials, turn everything into a smart material. And the way that we do that is we look at the material properties and we combine that with an activation energy. So wood might swell with moisture or metal might expand or contract with temperature. You know, any material is gonna have some kind of trigger with some kind of activation energy and you're trying to link those up. But then we need to combine that material with very precise geometry in two dimensional and three dimensional structures. And we can do that with different forms of fabrication whether that's printing or you know, textile knitting or weaving or injecting or lamination. Um, and by encoding those, that geometry and material properties, you get information that then can sense and transform. So that's basically our recipe of how do we program materials without typical computing, sensing, actuation. All the information and the ability, the agency is in the materials themselves. And a lot of this started in a project in 2012 called 4D printing. And the idea was that we would take 3D printing and we add the element of time, have things transform over time. We multi-material print in the joints as a hydrogel and it swells underwater. So we print these objects, place them underwater and they morph from a line into a cube or a line into the letters MIT or a surface into a truncated octahedron or a flat sheet into curved crease origami. Another one with Eric and Marty Domain. And then we did a flat sheet that expands and contracts into these doubly curved surfaces. Um, we did all sorts of different structures. We even did a 50 foot structure in the Z Center swimming pool, a big protein that folds underwater. You know, each one was trying to show something, 1D to 2D, 2D to 3D, 1D to 3D, all different kinds of geometries and joints, trying to show that we can control the behavior. But it was fairly abstract. It was like a demonstration of what's possible. And then lots of people started coming to us and saying, this is great, but can we do it without 3D printing? Can we do it without plastics? And so that made this a much larger agenda that we wanted to be able to program any material, led to lots of collaborations, lots of people on campus, many other um, places around the world, lots of industries. And that's about a third of our research now, like printed wood that morphs based on moisture or carbon fiber that transforms based on temperature, like folding, curling, twisting laminations that then open and close based on uh, either low temperature or sunlight. We did a, a shading system with Google. It's basically like stickers for buildings. You put it on facades. They can open and close with sunlight. This was a screen with, with steel case that then can create privacy and partitions that open and close. We did auxetic structures that expand and contract uniformly in, in multiple dimensions. And this is what led us into textiles. So at this point, we applied for a grant through a FOA, Advanced Functional Fabrics of America. And we said, we can do it with printing. We can do it with lamination. We think we can do it with fibers and yarns and knitting. And now about a third, all of the material research that I'm talking about is now in textiles. And so we have a number of researchers that are leading this, both the material and fiber and yarn side, as well as the knit structure. When you combine the material properties with the knit structure, we can control how the forces are distributed in the textile. So you can get thickness change for insulation value, or you can get porosity change for breathability, or you can get shape change for fit or styling. So we do all of this embedded directly in the textiles and we knit them uh, in our lab. But very quickly, as you develop all these materials, you start to think about, well, how do we make these materials? And so then you start to get into new fabrication processes. And we've developed two printing techniques. So the first one was called rapid liquid printing. And the idea is that we print inside of a vat of gel. The gel eliminates gravity. And the benefit there is that we don't have to print support material and we don't necessarily have to print layer by layer. You can do that, but you can also do spatial printing as we just saw in the last presentation. Um, we can change speed or pressure and that changes line weight and the material cures under the gel. So you don't have to wait for it to locally cure like an FDM or SLA or SLS. You have to cure at every single point. In this case, it's curing while you're going and you can move as fast as you want. So normally these are printed in tens of minutes. We can do centimeter to meter, so large scale things. And we can do industrially standard high quality materials like super high elongation, low durometer inflatables for soft robotics, or we can do foams and you know, obviously also rigid materials. But we started focusing on 
on soft, stretchy materials because printing is typically bad at that. And this was a project we did with BMW on the interior of a car. It was looking at a car seat cushion that could morph to um, encompass your body to create lumbar support, crash protection, massage features, all sorts of different things. Um, but we've done a lot of different collaborations over the years on like footwear and prosthetics, medical devices, lamps. Um, then we spun that out as a company, so we don't do a ton of research on that anymore. And we focus then in the lab on high temperature materials. So we play almost the same game, but we print with molten aluminum. And instead of the gel, because that would boil with the temperature of the, the aluminum, we print into a powder, and the powder is very, very small glass beads. So we print with molten aluminum, 600, 700 C. Um, we have to move very, very fast. So usually we print a whole structure in under a minute, so seconds, because it's, it's cooling rapidly. Um, and then you take it out of the, the powder and you get these large centimeter to meter scale aluminum structures. So it has a lot of the same benefits as the first one, very fast, very large, high quality materials. In the cross section, we're, we're trying to demonstrate that it's the same as sand casting, but we don't have to have a mold, so we can basically do free form, but there's another added benefit here that it's fully recyclable. So aluminum is almost infinitely recyclable. You can keep printing, melting, printing, melting. So that's a main advantage. Um, and we've done a lot of different projects over the years um, around this. So we basically have this kiln that we made that melts all the aluminum. Um, Zane, who's now doing his PhD at ETH, did his master's thesis on this. Um, and Pekko Hosoi was a, was a co-advisor on this. And he did a whole so a series of furniture pieces with these so large scale chairs, you know, each one printed under a minute or two. So very, very fast. We trade off resolution for speed, so you'll know it's a bit rough around the edges. You'll never want to do like high precision aerospace parts with this. Sintering is way better. But if you want to go very fast and very large, you, you can do that. And then one of the things we're looking at is that you can then post machine to get all the precision you need. So it's basically like casting the large parts on demand and then you can precision machine later. And then the last category, um, we look at large scale processes and we focus on the phenomenon of self-assembly as the lab suggests. Um, so self-assembly is where you have disordered parts, they come together to make ordered structures but without humans or robots. So how do parts literally build themselves? Like think about ourselves, our you know, humans, all the natural world, think about planets, you know, geology, all of those systems, there's no like screwdrivers and printers making them, they make themselves. And we've done about a decade's worth of research underwater, in the air, small things, big things. This one has unique components that come together to make the chair, or this one had weather balloons with helium. They have Velcro nodes, so they stick together in this courtyard and they make lattice structures. Um, we experimented with different variables, like how big could they be, how small could they be, what if you have differentiated components, what if the, you have self-similar components, what if you have Velcro, what if you use surface tension, what if you use magnets, what if you use temple, you know, all of these were different experiments that we did. But most of this research was thinking about it as basic research, like what's possible for self-assembly as we scale up. And then more recently that translated to a project in the Maldives um, where we're trying to look at the self-organization of sand that builds islands. Um, the main problem though is that they're facing sea level rise, uh, erosion, et cetera, so they use dredging. And they can build an island in about a month and you'll see that all over the, the coastlines around the world or you know, in the Middle East, building islands from scratch use dredging. It's, harm, it's harmful, it's super nasty, kills the reef, it's not great. But we became interested in that sandbars build themselves in the same amount of time that it takes to build those islands. And these are massive amounts of sand. So you know, over a meter above sea level, you can park your boat on it, you can you know, take it over for a day and have a party there or bring your family or whatever. It's a big amount of sand and it forms itself. So the real question is why does this happen? And we've been trying to study that. Our hypothesis is that it's the relationship between the water, so current, tide, waves, and the bathymetry, the geometry underwater, guides where sand ac accumulates or erodes. Um, we've been studying that both from you know, all of the historic research out there, as well as like modeling this, trying to understand the fluid flow, the sediment transport, how geometry interfaces with those. We also then do that physically in our lab through flumes. Um, Heidi Knepp is one of our collaborators and a lot of her research is on how vegetation traps sediment. So we've been experimenting with fields and ramps, all sorts of different geometries. And these, uh, the top left one pumps waves, the other two recirculates like current flow. And then we place these objects underwater and we study how that geometry or the field, you know, whatever the structure is, how that interfaces with the 
the water and the sand? And does sand accumulate or erode? And how can we optimize the geometry in order to promote the maximum accumulation in targeted areas? And these are totally passive, so there's no like pumping, um, there's no motors, there's no like mechanisms, it's just a geometry. We've done seven field installs in the Maldives, um, and these are 20 to 30 meter structures. We place them underwater, again, totally passively. I'll show you just one of those. So in 2019, we went, we built a 20 meter by four meter by two meter structure. We placed it underwater, um, and then it's been there since, and we've then just been studying that. So we do bathymetry surveys, we do drone scanning, satellite analysis, um, tilt sensors to measure the flow. In four months, we got about a half a meter, and then now we have two full meters of sand. So the sand is all the way up to the top of the structure. And again, it's just passive, it's just sitting there. So we've gotten two meters of sand, we have about a half a meter left to go to get to the top of the water. So the last um, aspect of this is then we started to think about it in how do we translate to this a, to a global scale. So we have this tank, there's actually one in the MIT Museum lobby, there's eight pumps, they turn on and off, and it's like changing the weather, and sand self-organizes to create these islands and sandbars. So we've been thinking about that, translating it to satellite, because then we could use this as prediction and monitoring. And right now there's not really a global tool for if you have a coastline or you have an island, you know, other than going out there and seeing that your beach eroded, how do we understand that? So we can easily monitor it by taking historic images. And then Walt Zesk is the PhD doing this and, and trying to build modeling tools that then allow us to predict it. So basically the left is the actual coastline change, the middle is the prediction, the right is the, the accuracy of that. So this is what we're trying to do is create this like health monitoring tool uh, for islands. So all of that is trying to utilize the research around self-assembly, self-organization, tap into the forces of the environment. You know, the first work was all about temperature, moisture, and sunlight. This work is really about waves, currents, tides, and how that can be used to self-organize structures. Um, all of the research that I've talked about today, though, is trying to address this challenge of how do you make smarter things? And in most industries, think of footwear or cars or clothing or building, it's devices. So like smart homes, it's Nest thermostats, Nike now has self-lacing shoes, you know, there's batteries in our pockets. Everyone thinks that smarter means more computing, more devices, more mechanisms. And the problem there is you have more energy, more failure, more cost. And so at some point, you're not actually smarter, you're worse. So you might as well do the, the dumb thing because it's gonna last longer and you know, be cheaper, et cetera. So we're up against that conundrum. Um, the simple proposal is that even if you have lots and lots of robotics and mechanisms, we still need smarter materials. And those materials can collaborate with robots, they can collaborate with the environment, they can adapt, respond, transform. The more ambitious one though, if you go all the way back to that programmable matter grant that I was talking about, almost all of those researchers have moved away from electromechanical devices and moved to soft robots. So, you know, soft inflatable pneumatic systems or 4D printing of programmable materials, granular jamming, synthetic biology. You know, there's a whole growing field of smarter and smarter materials, and that's because materials have sensing, actuation, and logic, the same elements of, of robots. So the vision of the lab is today we build smart robots and machines, sorry, and tomorrow we'll build smarter materials and environments. Thanks so much.